uh, Paddy O'Connell, who will be chairing tonight's First Wednesday. Um, before I do so, if I can ask you to switch your phones to silent, and when it comes to questions, if you can wait for the microphone, because we're broadcasting live. So, over to Paddy. Thanks very much, Millie. Hello, uh, friends, rivals. Uh, welcome to the surely the best panel on the most uh, electric subject anywhere in London tonight. Um, one of our panellists is on her way. Uh, she was in Afghanistan this morning. But the rubber on the road of our panellists in this country uh, is not surpassed anywhere t uh, this week, this year, uh, maybe even longer. Um, uh, we propose to, uh, to ask who will lead Afghanistan in a public meeting. Please, especially if you've paid, make sure you get an answer to each section, uh, as, as I will ask you. But can we all try and stick to three main sections? The candidates, the election and the challenges ahead. And obviously, uh, you will take issue with that, but we'll start with that plan. Who are the candidates? And then we'll move on after a few minutes. That'll, that's where we'll begin. So if, we, if your questions could be about the candidates, then we'll move on to the election. So anyway, enough from me. Uh, let's uh, meet the panel in their own world, words, uh, starting with uh, Michael Semple. Michael, would you introduce yourself and perhaps what you'd like us to know this evening or ask this evening? I'm Michael Simple. I've worked in Afghanistan for a while. I've uh, particularly worked on the Taliban over the past few years. And I hope that tonight we'll do some of the myth shattering that is going to be happening on a larger scale vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan around this election process. Because I think in this election process, long cherished myths over who calls the shots and determines the course of events in Afghanistan, they're in the course of being shattered. Those people who've clung to this idea that somehow you know, the Americans pull all the strings, the Americans can't control this. It's outside their control. Those people who cling to the idea that somehow this great power has emerged inside the palace, inside Afghanistan, that can also can manipulate everything and can deliver a cleanly, a cleanly conducted fraudulent exercise um, to pick one of the candidates, that myth is also going to be shattered. The idea that the Taliban, while only being a, a, a mobilized part, small part of Afghanistan, a tiny social group mobilized, that they can determine the course of events, that is also going to be shattered. A rather messy process of alliance building and a kind of popular mobilization is going to determine events in a way that none of these myths would ever have accepted. Thank you. For, wow, what a beginning. Uh, Michael didn't mention he was expelled by President Karzai. Uh, <laughs> for, for challenging myths. Right. So, but you, please stay in the room tonight, Michael. Um, Mr. Parcel is, is, is welcome. We welcome him back to the Frontline Club and his brain. Would you like to do the same job for us? A word about yourself and something about the topic? Yeah. I'm Emal Pasharlai. I'm working with uh, the Afghan section of the BBC. Um, coming to the myths, uh, um, the, in Afghanistan, a lot of people are saying that there are three uh, main um, uh, people or uh, organizations that could decide the election. One, are, one is the American, second is Karzai, and third is votes. Um, so whether we agree with it or not, but that's, that's everybody think about it. But as an Afghan, I'm very, very excited this time round about the election. This is the, um, after 2004, when we had the first election in Afghanistan, there was a lot of excitement in Afghanistan. But this time round also, there's a lot of excitement. Uh, people are thinking that there is a new hope, there's a new person to guide us ahead. Uh, and I think uh, uh, I, I go with that flow. I, I'm very hopeful and very excited. Are you eligible to vote? Uh, I don't have the card, I'm afraid. So, but I would, be, I would have been eligible to vote. Uh, thank you. And uh, Francis, to you next, please. Well, I was just about to say only that I'm, I'm, I've been a diplomat. Uh, I'm not a soothsayer. So I can't tell you what, who is going to um, win the elections in either in the first round or in the second round. Um, I wasn't planning to say anything, el anything else, but prompted by Michael, I would say that the key uh, in, in this election is going to be two things. One, to what degree is this election credible to most of the Afghan 
uh, of the Afghans. Uh, to what degree is the result somewhat acceptable, uh, but mainly credible? Uh, and, and second, to what degree will these elections uh, be eventually accepted by 100, no more than 100, 150 key players in Afghanistan who, uh, from whom it really depends whether there is going to be uh, a peaceful uh, succession to Karzai or whether uh, the outcome will be much messier. Thank you very much, Francis uh, Vendrelhas, a uh, long career in the UN and later in the EU. Um, <coughs> welcome. Who perfect, are you? So perfect, timing. Perfect, <laughs> perfect timing. Um, Haria Masadik is an Afghan human rights activist, uh, a journalist with 20 years of work who, who was in the country this morning. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very um, much. Thank we're you. just asking you to introduce yourself and to give us one uh, or two opening remarks that you wish we would all know if we talk about nothing else tonight. Yeah, thank you very much. Again, sorry for being late. I'm Huria Mosadek, and I work for Amnesty International as Afghanistan researcher. And as mentioned, I just returned from Afghanistan. I think the only thing that I would like to say that when I was in Afghanistan, of course, there was, uh, despite a series of violence that was uh, coming towards the elections and threatening the Afghan elections by the Taliban and other armed insurgent groups, Afghans are very much looking forward towards the elections. I spoke to many Afghans on the streets, on different places, in different provinces, and they were saying nothing can hold us back from going to the elections. What's the largest campaign rally you've seen or heard about? I think the largest campaign rallies Interestingly, it was in the most insecure provinces like Paktio, Kandahar, Helmand, and Kunduz. Numbers? Uh, I can't really say, but I think if not hundreds of thousands, but definitely thousands of people were in those political rallies. Thank you for your opening remarks. Those questions that Francis mentioned, would it be credible, would it be acceptable, and um, what we heard about other predictions of security, I'm going to put off. Let's get a briefing on who the candidates are for the first few minutes. Uh, if I can start in um, a different order, if I can start with you, Amal, who are the candidates? And then let everyone comment, and then we'll go to the floor. Um, there were 11 candidates. Um, out of those 11, three are now gone to uh, switch side, and the third one just said that uh, he had enough. So we have eight candidates now, um, but among these eight candidates, three are the front runners, so it's a kind of a three-horse race in a way. And these three, I call them the Afghan 3D. Uh, there are three doctors, uh, Dr. Uh, Ashraf Ghani, uh, Dr. Zalmay Rasul, and Dr. Uh, Abdullah Abdullah. Uh, these are the main uh, uh, three candidates, but then we have um, uh, former Mujahideen commander uh, uh, Ustad Sayaf, um, and also uh, someone from the Hezbi Islami party, uh, Khutbuddin Hilal, and um, there are some others which uh, are not that uh, important. I don't think they, they will gain much uh, votes. Francis Vendralis, is there much between them as, an, as a diplomat? What are you allowed to say? Who stands out? Oh, I, I'm allowed to say anything I wish. To oh. you. First, I'm <laughs> retired, and two years when I wasn't retired, as some people may recall, I used to speak my mind. So, sorry, but what do you want me to, to, well, to talk do, about? Well, no, well, anything you like. But uh, no, do, you, I mean, do you agree with the analysis there's three of eight? Yes. And, uh, absolutely. And would, uh, you, would you talk about them a bit more? Well, um, I think um, uh, Dr. Rasul, I mean, there are two medical doctors, and the third is probably a PhD of some kind, says I, who I don't have a PhD. So, uh, so there is a slight dismissive tone on my side. Um, I think uh, they will not set the, the country on fire, none of the three. But I think Ashraf Ghani <laughs> is probably seen as the more likely to, to carry out or try to carry out some uh, radical changes. Um, however, he, uh, you could argue that both he, uh, his ticket, which consists of himself and General Dostum, uh, there are two, uh, two people who are probably the people with a shorter fuse 
than anyone else in Afghanistan. So how they would be able to cooperate together after the first round uh, if uh, the ticket was one of the, fin uh, one of the finalists, we don't know. There's a clue there that we may need to be briefed on two rounds, but we're not there yet. O on the candidates, do you agree they're broadly three runners? And if so, Harir, can we speed forward to what are they standing about? What are the policies? But if you disagree, please mention. Otherwise, move us into the area of what they stand for. Yeah, I think I totally agree with uh, Mr. Windrill and with Mr. Pasale that uh, there are all these three candidates, Dr. Zainal Rasul, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, and Dr. Ashraf Ghani are the first like runners of the elections. And you can really see that from, from the political rallies that they are conducting. You can see from the way that they are trying to convince. And as an Afghan who have been witnessing so many elections, especially in the past 12 years, I think this has been the most serious campaigning that I have ever seen among the political candidates, among the presidential candidates for the elections. And uh, I think uh, there were quite mixed feelings about each of these candidates in different provinces that I was uh, traveling. Like in the East, people, despite uh, Dr. Ashraf Ghani was having a very popular support, but still there were quite a lot of hesitance regarding uh, his alliances with General Dostum. So this is early in the evening. Michael, do we see this as geographical or policy-based? And is it very um, personal? Is this candidates like a US presidential election to Afghanis, people who stand out on their personal qualities? I'd like to start by saying that uh, each one of the candidates deserves a certain tribute for the way in which they have campaigned. That they, and I think this goes across the board, the very fact that we are sitting here energized by this campaign is because all of the people involved in this, and it's particularly the, the leaders involved in this, have put their lives on the line. That they, exactly what the Ahuria said, that they, the, largest, the largest rallies have come from the most secure areas, places where, in, 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 in most insecure areas, that they were, this is again, this is myth shattering. The, I, the, the places that people have assumed that the Haqqani network that we've all focused on for the past few years, that they will, uh, you know, that they will shoot or blow up anything that moves in Paktika or, you know, or host. And suddenly you have the prospect of you know, Dr. Abdullah, who people thought maybe doesn't have any vote bank in this part of the country, is not just campaigning, but is doing walk around, uh, you know, as in two kilometers walking along the street with three rows of people on either side, uh, you know, clapping, clapping him through. So tribute to all of, the, uh, all of the leaders who risked their lives to do this and have mobilized the population in the course of it. But in terms of you know, the question as to, is it about personalities? Is it about policy? That's an old question. No, okay. So I thought I thought you were asking. You're no, asking I am, behind I am. Them, It's you're not behind, a very behind, good question. Yeah, exactly. But you... You're asking. You're asking about what what does it do with personality? You should not just look at these candidates. You have to look at the teams as a whole. You have to look at the vice presidential candidates, which are which are behind them. So there's a, and that's where the pattern starts to become clear. When you look at Dr. Zulmay Rasul. Uh, you see that he has chosen as one of his vice presidential candidates the uh, the brother of uh, Ahmed Shah Massoud, you know, martyred Mujahid hero, and then uh, Habiba Sarabi, the you know, daughter of an old communist era vice president, uh, and herself a um, uh, you know, a woman provincial governor. And then, of course, we know about uh, General Dostum as the Uz uh, Uzbek leader standing next to, uh, to Ashraf, server Danish, a uh, Hazara figure. We go over to, f um, uh, to Dr. Abdullah. He's taken a, uh, a Shia leader, Ustad Mahakik, as a, as a deputy, and a Hizbi Islami figure that they, as, a, his, uh, as his other vice president. What you see is, each in Afghanistan, the campaign involves an ethnic element. Identity politics are important in Afghanistan, but in the political culture which has emerged, there is a tremendous you know, pushback at allowing politics to go into a straight zero-sum game competition between the ethnic groups. Instead, the three major, the three, uh, major presidential candidates have conducted their campaigns as campaigns in alliance building in which each alliance must draw upon each of the major ethnic groups. So the competition is who is the most effective alliance builder cutting across all ethnic groups in Afghanistan. Would you like to comment? Is it a balanced ticket that we understand in the US sense? Is it a 
ethnic versus policy? Is it tribal? Is it geographic? Francis, how are you seeing? Well, I wouldn't say it's policy. Uh, the only, the only uh, I think, uh, when you look at what they each say, they, pretty, they say pretty much the same, with the exception uh, in a mode, uh, of Ashraf Ghani, who has a more detailed program. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's going to make much difference uh, in terms of policy. Are there any policies like, we'll try and educate girls, uh, we'll try and plug more people into electricity, we'll clean up the water. Are there any policies that would, similar to other elections we've seen in the developing world, or is it all very linked to Afghanistan's recent history? Um, Ashraf Ghani, uh, Ghani uh, for instance, he mentioned a lot of uh, the, the stuff that in other parts of the world we, we hear. For instance, he, he promised to create one million jobs. This was something unheard of in Afghan politics to somebody come and talk about uh, jobs. Or he, he said that uh, he will uh, build uh, uh, half a million houses. This is also something completely new. The others didn't mention these uh, sort of things. They were more general, I think. Yeah, I think uh, this is true. I think at the beginning, many other candidates, including Dr. Abdullah and uh, Zalmay Rasul, they learned from Ashraf Ghani on how to target each province based on their own needs. Like just uh, two nights before, when Dr. Ashraf Ghani was talking in Bamiyan, he talked how he wanted to make Bamiyan as one of the best tourist destinations in Afghanistan, which, uh, as Pasale said, it was unheard of. C can I leave this room and say to my friends, tourism is an issue in the Afghan election? Yeah. They won't okay. think I'm a fool. <laughs> Well, they did already think that was but... I, I want to come in on that. I think that the, uh, I think that, you know, Huri is right in the sense there's been a this discourse between the candidates. And I think that uh, when you look at the, when you look at the detail that every now and then Zulmai Rasul and Dr. Abdullah have said, you know, they'll come onto jobs and they'll come onto houses. They're all talking the same so thing. For the, the difference is, not if, you look, if, you, if you look, if you look, you'll find some details from the others as well. The difference is that did many of the supporters, many of the supporters of Ashraf Ghani actually expect him to do it. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons is that one part of the baggage that Ashraf Ghani brings to this is track record of actually trying to do this. The people have, people have over the past few years focused on all the things we didn't do in Afghanistan and the Afghans didn't do. If you look at uh, Ashraf Ghani's track record from the early part of the Bonn process, it is actually delivering the first stages of state building changing the currency, which was a very important uh, part of the launching of this. They, they, they ch changed the currency, introduced a new currency. He overturned the customs regime to try and regather, re regain control of the revenues for, this, uh, for the centre, and he, he played a pivotal role uh, in pushing through the disbandment of the militias, <coughs> so that he brings a baggage of actually trying to implement policies. Um, I'm coming to you if you want to catch my eye. Can I ask you, uh, Francis, is it relevant that the Taliban can't bring themselves to be involved uh, in this? They're not standing in any way. Uh, before we move on to talk about the election, uh, d the fact that they're not even bothering, is that a surprise? No, um, it's not a surprise at all. I mean, uh, the surprise would have been if they had to be supporting anyone or trying to influence the election. So they're I not think, supporting any of the candidates? Uh, I think that the main dis wish is to disrupt the election as much as possible, they de de legitimize the election. So my question is to you, are there four candidates, the three leading ones and the, the non-Taliban candidate, the empty chair? You might, you might say that, but it, 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 it's too easy, it would be too easy to say that, let's say, if 60% of, of the voters vote and 40% do not vote, it would be completely out of the question to say that these 40% are pro-Taliban. They simply have either decided not to vote, as happens in many countries, or they have been afraid to vote. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are supporting the Taliban. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, Francis, Mr. Ventrell is uh, true to uh, some extent that, yes, uh, the other people who may not vote, this is not because they are not supporting the elections or whatsoever, but let's also look at how people have been betrayed in the past 12 okay. years by the government. Okay, so on the candidates, is there anything, yes, to you at the back, this is the candidates, and then we'll move on to the election. Sorry, um, I was going to ask about the election. Okay, we'll, we'll, okay. we'll take you first on the election. Oh, to the right. candidates, I'll come to you first, I promise. It just helps us to move along. Hi. Um, I'm quite fascinated about some of the alliances that are being built with some old shady characters like Dostum. Um, my question for you, each of you, 
if you had to pick one candidate that would deliver the best outcome for the people of Afghanistan, who would it be and why? You don't have to answer, but that's his question. <laughs> I, I, will, I will answer it with a dodge. And the, but I think you may learn something from the dodge, because I would answer that by saying that my personal, my personal interest is working in conflict resolution and on peace processes. And as somebody focused in working on conflict resolution and peace processes, I look forward to working in some small, humble way alongside whichever of them, whoever of them, emerges as the leader of Afghanistan. I suspect that my thinking is probably replicated by many Afghans around the country. It's like the oracle. Um, so, would you like to answer, Amal? Would you like to give a name? <coughs> well, um, we are not supposed to give names. <laughs> um, I mean, among the, these three candidates, if we focus on these uh, three candidates, um, one is a man of action, one is a very, shall I say, a dull person, and don't ask me which one, and uh, <laughs> one is a, a, a kind of a person uh, who hasn't delivered much. So now you pick which one is which. Well, I mean, I, I'm obviously not going to say who would be the best. I would simply say that uh, Ashraf Ghani uh, he, uh, seems more energetic and more likely to deliver changes. Now, whether these changes will be good or bad is another matter. Uh, I would say that Dr. Rasul has, is probably the most decent of the three candidates uh, on, a, as a person, on a personal basis. I think he has probably the cleanest ticket. Uh, I think it would be hard to find uh, questions with most for at least two of the three <laughs> candidates uh, in his in his ticket. <coughs> I would say Dr. Abdullah has grown in his position. I've known him since 1997, and he's a man who could, who is not uh, a target nationalist, and who could also carry out a very good a very good job. So. So that's basically it. Yeah, unfortunately, I will not vote for any of these three runners. Uh, Ashraf Ghani, because he allied himself with General Dostum. Dr. Abdullah, because of his background with Northern Alliance, and he is still being allied with the most dodgy, with uh, suspected criminal records. And Zalmay Rasul, he's not the man of action. So, yeah. Okay, so um, any other questions on the candidates? Okay, it's, let's move on to the election. Do we have anyone in the room? The panel have expressed optimism about the election. Do we have any election pessimists in the room to start Sorry, this session? What, what do you Your, mean, uh, express optimism? I think, you, I think you... We haven't said anything. Oh, okay, okay. I'm, too, I'm speaking early. But let's start with a, a sort of member of the audience who wishes to express some pessimism. You, sir. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, here's the pessimistic view. I'm, I'm just wondering, is this whole debate a bit academic? I mean, yes, I yes mean, it is very academic. I mean, and the election it, is, there's three doctors. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I was just thinking about 1989 when the Russians pulled out and the whole thing basically fragmented. You know, the common enemy left. All the Mujahideen groups just broke out and started fighting each other. When the ISAF withdraws, isn't the same thing going to happen? And all these sort of debates about the finer points of policy are just going to get lost in a kind of violent brawl for survival. OK, and we'll come please back... Tell, please tell me I'm bleak. Right, we'll come back to that at the end. Would you like to answer that, Francis, first? No, I'd rather, I'd rather wait to the second... To the end. Oh, to the end, to OK. To the third question. I'll, I'll say something on it. Yep. The, um, the Soviets were opposed by the Mujahideen. With whatever problems emerged with the Mujahideen, Mujahideen later on, the Mujahideen had constructed a national movement. <coughs> there was a mobilization of Afghan society whose military manifestation was the Mujahideen. The Taliban movement is a movement of armed mullahs, predominantly from one small part of the country, who have brought in some armed mullahs from other part of the country. It is a small social category inside Afghanistan. And in 20 years of the movement, it has not managed to expand its base beyond that. And even with the gift, the gift 
of being able to run an armed movement against the United States. We know, look, if you run an armed movement against the United States, in Britain you could mobilize people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the reality. I mean, you know, in, in the eastern US or the southern US you could as well. The Taliban, in over a decade of mobilizing against the United States, have failed to mobilize the Afghan population, and that's what we are witnessing in this election. If you want the media answer to the answer to your pessimism, look who has been mobilized in this election. I mean, you, you may detest some of the alliances, but at least this basic point that there is either some optimism for the future and there's a sense of national unity <coughs> inside Afghanistan, which is the exact rejection of the idea of some of Afghanistan going to the dogs. To you at the back. Hi. Um, democracy in Afghanistan, I think, is in inverted commas. When do you think the panel thinks that there'll be a time, there'll be a president, that rather than calling the elders to decide on major issues, will call the parliament to decide on major issues? Um, um, this, uh, this is uh, something that uh, uh, I believe you're talking about, the Louis Jarga. Louis Jarga is uh, a traditional um, system of Afghanistan for, for thousands of years. And uh, it is something that uh, even in our constitution is there. So it is uh, a legitimate uh, uh, act, I believe. It's like the House of Lords. Yes, exactly. You there we are. Yeah. Um, Haria, can you hold fire? Because I'd, I... I <laughs> I, I, I'm going to give you time to come back on this. Francis, will you lead us on the question now of the election? You were the first to mention a second round. Would you give us a briefing on when that would be and what the arithmetic is by well, which it would go to a second round? I, mean, I would think, uh, I didn't say there will be a second round. I think it is likely there will be a second round because it's hard to imagine uh, any of the three candidates getting 50 plus one. Um, I... I uh, I think that uh, there will be a lot of questioning of the outcome of the elections. Uh, whoever is not in the, whoever doesn't win, uh, will question the result and will allege fraud. Uh, the issue is how, how, how widespread will this belief be? Will they be able to put people in the street, as some of them say? Uh, or will they not? So uh, are, are you saying that the, res the, f the result of the first round will be disputed? Yes. That's a it good... Was, we were here it's for very a likely, It's very likely to be disputed, uh, simply because there, were, there was fraud in the past. Uh, there is a potential for fraud at the moment. And uh, in many parts of, uh, of... In that part of the world, it's particularly common for the so, loser to allege fraud. So, Haria, we're all here for a briefing. There are three main candidates. There's a lot of optimism uh, for reasons on the panel you've expressed, not universal, uh, and the result will be disputed. Are you with the, the, the flavour of things so far? <coughs> Uh, yeah, definitely. I think uh, one of the biggest concerns that many Afghan people are having in Afghanistan because right now in many insecure parts of the country, the bullet boxes may be filled pre-elections and then it may favour a candidate that is favoring by the government. So this is the biggest fear and this is the biggest scandal that many Afghans are speaking about. And they also see, unfortunately, it is not what I say, this is what many Afghans are talking and seeing that the government itself may have a hand in some of the insecurity in some parts of the country in order to manipulate the voting. So it itself may contribute to but dispute. But there's only one thing that uh, um, there's no specific or clear uh, government candidate in this election. In the past, uh, we had uh, President Karzai, who was uh, president, so um, he was the main candidate for the government. But this time around, even the cabinet is divided. Forget about the cabinet. Even the presidential palace is uh, divided. Right, but Some it, of it, is Huria right that there will be ballot boxes stuffed before anyone shoved a voting paper in? Is that uh, correct? I'm, I'm not that... Uh, um, uh, well, it's either sorry, yes or no, isn't it? No. I no. Say no. You're wrong, Huria. No, I'm not saying that you're wrong. But oh, you're what right. I'm saying, you're right. What I'm saying is that... Uh, I think that's too negative uh, thinking. Well, it's quite negative in an election to have a ballot box full before there's been any voting. Of course it's not possible. In that sense, it's not possible. Well, no, Haria's saying it is possible. This happened in 2009 yes. elections. Yeah, 2009 this different. happened in well, 2010 elections. Is this going elections. to happen now? And this is what right. people are fearing, that it Afraid may happen. Of. Right, in nothing has happened. Let, let, me come, let me come in with some of the arithmetic. The, the reason that we're talking about the first and second round is because the rule is that if no candidate achieves 50% in the first round, you go to a second round. Now, 
the, uh, the Americans thought that one of their great contributions to Afghan democracy during this campaign would be funding uh, opinion polls. And they had this great idea that this would encourage behavior because they, so they, the no-hope candidates, when they see that they've got no hope because they've read the opinion polls, will you know, drop out and side with a potential winner. Um, but of course, you know, right at the start of the campaign, um, somebody had a word with the Americans and say, we don't like this kind of, they, basically they were told, back off. They cut the opinion polls. However, it's not possible to suppress these completely. We've all got our own, uh, 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 our own uh, snapshots uh, of what the, uh, what the opinion is. My best understanding of the competition between the big three is that the Dr. Abdullah and Dr. Ashraf Ghani are vying for first and second place, probably Dr. Abdullah in the lead. Both of them can realistically be expecting now that they're in the 30s of percent for, the, uh, for support, uh, and that uh, Dr. Zulmai Rasul is probably trailing in third place and you know, is prob probably reached <coughs> double figures. But the ranking, the ranking is one, two, three, either Abdullah, Ashraf, Zulmai, or conceivably one Ashraf, two, two Abdullah, three Zulmai. Now, the, the, reason I, the, reason I go in, the reason I go into this is, first of all, that what we understand of popular support is that nobody gets a first, a first round victory. But when it, comes down to the, when it comes down to the rigging, on the basis of the election culture, which has developed over the past decade, there is a realistic expectation that there will be industrial scale rigging, which is what Dr. Abdullah uh, has talked about. The expectation, that doesn't necessarily mean that it happens, there's an expectation. For those people who doubt it, I ask, why is it that when you talk to power brokers in Afghanistan, people who are involved practically in politics, what their discussion is, hey Paddy, how many thousand uh, uh, voter registration cards do you have? Only 40,000, Paddy? I thought that you were a real, you know, that you were a real man. You've only got 40,000, I've got 50,000. The expectation is that they can translate mass collections of voter registration cards into votes using the techniques that Huri has said. Imal is absolutely right when he says that the, president, the, the right. presidential team is more divided than it has been previously, but still, there is a, in terms of the core of the presidential palace, presidential, President Karzai himself would be most comfortable, I think, with a Zulmai victory. Right. He's certainly not going to rig in favor of the <coughs> others. The challenge is, if he were to rig somebody, somebody who is currently running about 10 or 11 or 12 percent and put him into, you know, and deliver him victory, there would be an uproar. Francis, it's not so much how to vote as how to rig, I'm now hearing. Well, I'm, I must say my former deputy is taking a great deal of time in presenting his views. Uh, uh, I feel like touché, I'm in the, touché, I'm in the touché, diplomatic... Touché, touché, touché. Uh, I don't have any problem with what he's actually saying. Uh, all I would say is on opinion polls that uh, I, I'm not sure to what degree they are credible. Uh, Afghans have a tendency to tell people what they want to hear. Uh, they are probably conducted in the cities and not in the countryside, so it's a question mark. But it is, it, I would agree that if that President Karzai would probably feel most comfortable if foreign min former Foreign Minister Rasul won the election uh, and became president, because he would probably believe that he could manipulate him or he could play a, 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 a still a role after retiring. And you've already briefed us that there will be a disputed result. Well, I'm not surprised if it's industrial scale rigging. Do you think it's enough to tip the result, this rigging? I, I did not say that there was going to be industrial uh, scale rigging. Your, deputy, your former uh, deputy said. I said, said. I said an expectation of it. Oh. I said an oh. expectation. <laughs> it's a different thing. They, they may not get away with it. Is anyone keeping notes? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Re thank you, my Based friend. On track record. <laughs> I, I think it would be. It would provoke a major reaction if there was industrial scale uh, fraud. So it's, 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 it's possible. Um, many, some candidates would consider it probable. I, I don't want to, t to, to give an opinion at the moment. Can you all tell us if we should trust the observer uh, missions? I, I understand that the OS, uh, some of the Europeans have left because of the recent attacks. Who's left observing, Horia, do you know? I think uh, there are uh, around 30,000 Afghan observers. 30? 
30,000. 30,000. Yeah, 30. Uh, it is 30,000 Afghan observers that will be spread all over the country, and they will observe the uh, voting process. But now the concern is how much these observers will be really able to go and monitor the electoral process in insecure places, in insecure areas oh. where attacks are happening and where people are whether beheaded or being threatened by the Taliban and other armed insurgents. I, I think there will be very few foreign observers because of security. A lot is going to depend on, in terms of the outside perception on what the few foreign journalists who will be there will report. And I do think, I don't think 30,000 is probably a little exaggerated. I think if there are already 10,000, it will be very good. And there is one major NGO, uh, Afghan NGO called FIFA, which is going to be the most prominent. Uh, whether they have the capacity <laughs> and the resources to, to really observe and, and report, I think they'll do their best. It's the question. Uh, there's one uh, other thing. Uh, this time around, a lot of Afghans uh, are into the social media, and uh, a lot of them have very good uh, mobile phones. You will see from the first hour of the election uh, a lot of videos on, on, on Facebook and Twitter. So I think these uh, uh, observers are more important, and you will get a lot of uh, the corruption or the fraud uh, uh, cases through that social yeah, media. In terms of the figures, it was announced by FIFA and TIFA organizations, the two main local organizations that are set up to monitor the elections. Just to reassure you, this isn't set blatter. Anything to do with set blatter, this FIFA. <laughs> that um, um, before I move to you in the room, um, one thing that astonished me, as uh, who knows little uh, about this country, is the extraordinary vibrancy of the TV network in Kabul, uh, which is then spread out through the country. And as a journalist club, I wonder if you who have expertise in the room and if you on the panel could give us a clue of the vibrancy of the media and the way it will be reported. Excite us. Uh, I've already been amazed to find that tourism will be a uh, policy. Will this be a vivid, bristling campaign on the television? Will it be exciting? Yeah, I think uh, the candidates are more and more using the local media, especially Tolo TV have been very proactively broadcasting all the, uh, not only the campaign, but also debate among the candidates, among the spokesperson, and different campaigners of the candidates. And they are trying to pose very hard and tough questions on the candidates, including questioning the General Dustom's background as being a suspected war criminal and how now he is being allied by Ashraf Ghani, who himself have been critical of Dustom's background. And ML, do people watch these channels in large numbers? Yes, there are uh, 76 televisions in Afghanistan, and uh, in the past month, uh, nearly 80% was election. Uh, and um, apart from uh, the television and radio, there are hundreds of radios also, uh, apart from radio and television, the social media, I mean, uh, in the past month, I haven't seen anything other than election um, and there are more than 1 million um, Facebook users inside Afghanistan and thousands of uh, Twitter users also. So Michael Semple with the pessimists in the room this is very humbling isn't it with the lives lost uh, with the extraordinary history of conflict from the outside in this country Afghans are caring they are interested in this democratic process albeit about to be rigged by somebody it's, it's quite humbling to realise that millions of Afghans give a damn. Well I think this is what I was talking about at the start when saying that this is a real myth-busting myth process. And I think there's been deep cynicism uh, has set into the debate about Afghanistan, certainly in this country, over the past couple of years. And I think actually Afghans have been challenging some of that cynicism over the, the past couple of months of this campaign. Um, and, uh, and in terms of the people who should be eating their hearts out over it, I think that the, um, uh, any thoughtful Taliban, I think, will also be eating their hearts out. Because they, um, uh, they, you know, they knew they couldn't. They knew they couldn't stop the election process. But not only have they not stopped it, I mean, they haven't even been able to, right, to dampen it down. But uh, and that they, and that they, and I think that. Uh, you know, it, that's not going to end the, the campaign of violence immediately, and it's not going to convince them that, oh, well, okay, that this, this system, this regime has somehow achieved, uh, has achieved legitimacy. <coughs> but I think those inside the movement are saying there's no military victory um, uh, to this. I think this is going to be strengthening their hands when they tell them, look, I mean, just look at the mobilization which has gone, which has gone on here. We, you cannot force these PACL, you, you cannot force Afghans to accept what you're imposing upon them. And, uh, uh, and on no, Afghans, uh, um, they knew even from day one that there will be fraud and there will be insecurity. 
So they expected that. And these two things are not going to shock Afghans. So they are optimistic, and they are uh, hopeful, and they are no, excited. I, I think it's very, I mean, it's very significant, but not necessarily surprising. And certainly not humbling. I think that's an American term uh, constantly being used. Uh, people are humbled all the time. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but what I would say humble, is, humble on this panel. Humble is, certainly, is certainly not surprising that uh, <laughs> Afghans, like everybody else in the world, want to determine and decide their future. And I think that's extremely important. As for the crowds uh, attending all these meetings, I should say, if I were Taliban, and not only Taliban, there are many who would say the same, is that you rent the crowd very easily in Afghanistan. You do bus people, you do provide them with a meal, and on some occasions you even provide them with a tip on the way out. There was so, no meal this time so, and there was no uh, tips. Uh, well, I don't know about, uh, about this particular one case, but I can assure you that when I was there, that's what I was, I was hearing. Horia, um, it sounds to me that it's like a sort of mass kite flying operation you know, for the Taliban, it's extremely challenging to see all these people voting. Um, do you back it up from coming back today from the country? Is that the sense? Yes, definitely. I think I have been talking to someone. He's an elder of Hutak tribe from the south. And he was telling me that, to be honest, Taliban know that they are not winning any way into the Afghan politics. If they knew that they could, even they could keep 5% of the Afghan votes, they would stand for the elections. Because they know that there is no space in political era now, and they can't really win it. This is why they turn into violence. OK, let's come to the floor. It's lovely to see hands up. This is a public meeting. Come to you first. Um, won't the notion of democracy and the results of the election be rendered meaningless um, when the new government, whoever is in charge, strikes a political settlement with the Taliban? because you might have the Taliban being given districts and swathes of land which they can control and be in charge of. You might have Taliban um, members being just shunted into government. OK, I'm going to call you back at the section on the challenges ahead. This is about the election. I promise to call you again. If you've got questions on it, not you, you've asked one. Questions on the election, we're doing, as you can hear here, fraud, observers, policies, candidates. That's to you. You've got your hand up now. I'll come back to you about the challenges ahead. I just wanted to ask, I've heard that there's high uh, mobile phone penetration in Afghanistan, if that is correct, and hearing also from you that social media have an increased role in the life of uh, Afghanistan. Why cannot mobile phones be used to maybe in the future conduct elections, but for the current elections to at least do a parallel polling? Uh, so that that can maybe give an idea of how much of the elections were rigged. Well, it's a good question. Uh, does anyone want to take it? Because it's obviously not happening this time, so you may not know. Um, you don't have to answer because we'll move on. Right, we don't know the answer. Well, I, I, think, I think we can answer that every, every organ that has been involved in this election, whether you're talking about the, the election commission, whether you're talking about the observers, whether you're talking about the media, or whether you're talking the campaigns, they have all relied upon the mobile network to extend their reach. Okay, this, is not not a this is not a campaign right. which is happening in Kabul. To you first, and then pass it in front. <coughs> Um, I was actually going to ask a very similar question, so I'll be very quick. And in fact, I wanted to also ask really whether the social media in Afghanistan is picking up on the improvements since 2009. So uh, ink that doesn't wash off your hands, uh, ballot papers may have been reproduced, but they've got much better barcoding systems this time. Um, you know, it may sound a bit naive to have faith in technologies in a country like that, but, you know, I think it does reinforce what you were saying, Michael, about the, 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 the way Afghans really want this to work. There have been improvements that have been made, and shouldn't we be reinforcing that spirit of these elections? Uh, well, uh, um, <coughs> Afghans are using uh, much more sophisticated uh, mobile, shall I say. Uh, and um, when I say that they will be filming and they will be um, talking about uh, rigging if there is anything, they will be from all sides, I mean, all the different candidates. And one could definitely see that what is uh, right and what is wrong. Uh, I'm personally very happy uh, for it, and I think uh, this election will be much better than the past. 
Um, th this dance about this fraud in elections, we've seen this play out in a number of different countries now, you know, in Thailand, in Bangladesh and the like, where the winning party claims a wide mandate and the losing party says everything is fraud. And it seems to me that one of the reasons for that is the lack of the democratic institution that underlies it. It's much more than voting. Um, and do, 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 do you think that in relation to Afghanistan that those democratic institutions really exist in order to give this election real legitimacy? And I'm talking about, you know, a powerful and, and, and an independent judiciary, an engaged oh. voter um, pop, 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 populace, you know, oh, rule okay. of law and the like. No, I mean, uh, one thing is voting and wanting to vote, and, and I think the Afghans do want uh, to, uh, to determine their future, but there are no institutions, and one of the great failures of, of Western failures over the past 13 years has been the failure to build rule of law institutions. So we have no serious, uh, not an independent police system, certainly no independent judiciary or learned judiciary, uh, and this, uh, there is no real civil service. And now, it's true that these things take a long time. It's easier to try and build an army than to build the judiciary. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we, have to, we are a long way from having what I think any of us would call a democracy in Afghanistan. We have the beginnings of something that eventually may well lead to a pluralistic society with uh, democratic institutions. The, what, what Afghanistan has instead of the institutions, and you might say it's a, sort of like, it's a poor second, but it's the Af it is the Afghan alternative exists there, is they have their own disputes resolutions procedures. So that they have the ability to uh, conduct bargaining and cut deals. And I think that this is one of the reasons that they, you know, there's not going, you know, it's not possible to sort of, you know, rig this like, you know, Saddam Hussein Iraq style. That because there will have to be bargaining, there is a sense of the, um, in the you know, the, the underlying sh share of the various different actors who have been involved in this alliance building process. There will be intense negotiation that goes on during the process of disputing the first round results and during the movement from the first round to the, to the second round. There will be intense bargaining between the actors. So it's not, that the, it's not that one aggrieved party will go straight to the Supreme Court and wait for the appeal in the Supreme Court to be heard to decide. There will be uh, feelers put out from all the th of the three major parties, of the three major candidates, teams, and the presidential palace to try and agree on the election right. results. Can I move to security? Um, I think, Haria, it was you who mentioned people are being beheaded if they vote. Uh, would you like to talk more about the threats to the system from the Taliban or anyone else? I, I didn't say that people will be beheaded, but people are scared if it may happen to them. Because in the previous elections, what happened, some people who voted, their fingers were cut off because it was having the ink of the bullet papers. So this is the fear that it exists across the board, especially with the increased Taliban and other armed insurgent groups attacks on polling stations, on electoral bodies, on campaign offices, and also on the presidential candidates and sometimes on their campaigners. I think the level of the killings that happens in the past one month or so, it haven't, we haven't seen that uh, like in the uh, 2009 and 2004 elections that were carried out. But it's still, despite all the insecurity that exists, what really made me to, like, I was amazed by the courage that many Afghans, men and women, are having. They still want to cast their vote. Uh, and we, they still want to go to the bullet boxes. Uh, uh, comparing it to 2009, uh, this time a lot of uh, districts uh, in Afghanistan are able to vote. For instance, in 2009 in Ghazni, um, uh, only six of 18 uh, districts managed to vote. But this time, it will be much uh, larger than that. And it seems that it's much braver to vote as a woman than as a man. It just feels to me as though to, to, for a woman to do this carries more risks than a man. Am I right? Yes, absolutely. I think especially in the areas that are being controlled or influenced by the Taliban, it is quite risky. And at the same time, I think there are other areas where 
some presidential candidates are threatening communities or their campaigners that they should vote for a particular candidate. And if they do not, they may f uh, face the consequences. So it's, the threat is not only coming from the Taliban and, and insurgent groups, but it also comes from the campaigners and candidates themselves against another candidate. Firstly, I'm glad that we're not talking too much about the Taliban in this discussion because it's, you know, we should cap the, you know, the, 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 the focus on the Taliban in the election discussion should be, you know, should be no more than sort of five or six percent because Huria rightly says there are many other factors. I think that when we analyze this, uh, this campaign from the perspective of, you know, when it's well and truly over, I think we will realize that the discourse on civilian casualties, which has been going on over the past couple of years, has actually changed the practice of the war. And the Taliban had the capacity to inflict significant Afghan civilian casualties during this election campaign if they had really wanted to disrupt it. I believe that they have been frightened to do so because they concluded that that would be counterproductive. Yes, they have put out the scary messages. Yes, they have tried to do intimidation. But that they fortunately, fortunately, in the grand scheme of things, and compared to this dreadful, unnecessary war, the number of Afghans who have been killed, as, you know, as it says, the Taliban targeting Afghans involved in the election campaign has actually been relatively small. Instead, they've tried to come up with something a little bit more subtle to try and be seen to be targeting the institutions. So it's, for them, it's OK to go and attack the, uh, the election commission headquarters, not to attack poor, ordinary voters. For them, it seems OK to go and attack the foreigners. So they burst into the Serena, which they label as a foreign target, even if the people they actually kill are Afghans. Uh, so they've tried to come up with this campaign where they are deliberately holding back from inflicting mass civilian casualties. Amal, do you agree? Do you think security will, will be a factor? Will it change the result? Will it put many people off? Um, I would say no. Um, Comparing it to 2009, I think this time is uh, much better. Um, I have uh, s spoken to a lot of people in the insecure places, and they are much more uh, encouraged, and they, I think they, they will vote this time rather than... Can, I, to can so I put it this time. way? Do you both fear for members of your family who vote? No. No? no. Is that because you live, they live in cities, or do, is it because you, you're, you're just lucky to have family who... who no, I think uh, because they live in a secure place. They live in a secure but place. In, in if you case, had family members who did not, would you be afraid? Yes, absolutely. But in my case, my, uh, some of my family is living in um, a village in the north of the country where the Taliban are active. But uh, they are telling me that they, they will vote. No, I, I would simply caution that, uh, at least in my case, I certainly don't know. I mean, uh, the, the percentage of people voting in Afghanistan has been dropping since 2004. So each time, in each election, there's been less participation. Uh, this happens also in other countries, but I mean, it's happening there. But, uh, partly because um, of fear of fraud, but mainly for fear of security, uh, for, because of security reasons. So I don't know at the moment, and I, I think it's a little bit uh, over, uh, it's, uh, it's unwarranted to say people are going to vote massively, they are terribly excited, they are going to vote. No, I, I would say that uh, this time, comparing it to 2009, there will be more voters. In 2004, everyone was excited because it was the first time election and uh, there was uh, peace also uh, back then. But in 2009, first of all, they had the same candidate and also uh, there was more insecurity. This time around, the um, personalities are different and uh, there is more security than 2009. Probably a lot of people will be uh, surprised to hear that. Uh, I confess that I am surprised to hear that there is greater security. But I do agree that the candidates are, uh, I mean, the, the outcome of the election is less obvious. And of therefore, there will be more interest. Yeah. yeah. I would argue that there is uh, no uh, much security compared to 2009. If it is not worse, at least it will be the same level of insecurity. And this is just to look from the comments that you receive, not only from the Ministry of Interior, but also from the district governors, from the members of the Afghan parliament, who keep talking on and on about the insecurity and how the elections may not happen in certain districts or places around the country. I agree that uh, everybody is talking about insecurity, and this is a big issue. But what I'm saying is that uh, in 2009, 
and a lot of uh, provinces, uh, election was not possible, basically. But this time around, this is not the case. I mean, uh, again, I will give you the example of uh, Ghazni province. Out of 18 districts, only six were managed to vote. But this time, this is not the case. I mean, those who got the... How do we know this uh, is by, not the By case? registration uh, cards. Those in 2009, nobody went there to get a, a registration card. This time, they did. So I think there is, there is a difference between uh, 2009 and uh, this time. I think we have to be careful alongside our optimism. And you know, a lot of this, yeah, it, how it turns out on the day, we'll see it. You know, there'll be some empirics on this. Already, the Interior Ministry has been through a security assessment whereby they have closed the, is it about 10% of the stations? 12. Yeah. 10 to 12. Yeah, 10 to 12% of the polling stations have basically been cut off the list because the Interior Ministry decided that uh, it was simply too insecure to, to carry these out. So in a sense, for me, in a sense, that's actually a good sign that they're playing it by the rules. There's another gray area those, those areas that the, uh, that the Interior Ministry have designated, it's okay, it's fine, and yet maybe there'd be a disagreement between Huria and the Imal as to whether people are actually prepared to go there. Because just so that we get ready for the, the, the fraud story ahead, when there is a contest over did fraud happen or did it not, it will be in that grey area. In these places where there will be one story that we'll hear, and it'll be from the Interior Ministry and from maybe from the sort of winning candidate, uh, saying that, yes, polling happened in those areas. And there'll be the, those who are contesting it will be saying, there weren't any voters, they were fake polling stations. Can you prove any evidence? OK, you brought back the ca Oh, OK, you brought back the boxes. OK, you published the results. But nobody actually saw anybody vote there. And everybody will be trying to work out what really happened in those places. Was there or was there not real voting? To you, just please. I'd like to reiterate that point that Michael just made, 2009, lots of people voted in Sangin, but nobody actually went to a poll. <laughs> and I think my other point is, or is really to Michael about the election. You're into the business of busting myths. It, how much is Pakistan going to take an interest, destabilise in order to affect the election? But don't answer that. We'll come to that. Can I ask you, were you in Sangin in 2009? I was. And um, will you be going? Will you be one of the few trying to go this time, or is that over for you? I think it's uh, it's over for me. <laughs> it's over go for on, you. sign up again. Right. So, were you were you out with him at the same time? Uh, no, I was uh, OCA Company Four Rifles. I've just written a book called Honourable Warriors. Okay. Um, your second part of your question, I'm going to call in a moment. Uh, I'm just going to move on to this second area about the challenges ahead. Given that you've come, like me, for a briefing on the election day, the election process, let me just add as we move on. If there isn't a clear result this time, the second round will be on the 28th of May. We've heard more information. I'm proposed to move to the challenges ahead. Does anyone have any unfinished business on the election? Yes, to you. And then I'll come to you. I interrupted. Thanks. Um, my question was about sort of long-term security, whether or not it's actually on voters' minds. I was wondering if you think there's much awareness or there's going to be any sort of tactical voting because the longer that the election draws on with the second rounds, um, my understanding is that there's going to be some repercussions for the bilateral security agreement. I was wondering if that's a concern for the population. So we're coming to the bilateral security agreement later, but will there be tactical voting, Horia? Uh, I think it's difficult to really say, but uh, definitely I think... Uh, there are situations that people may vote, and there are situations, as Michael mentioned, there are the gray areas. And the biggest concern that right now many Afghans are, say, are seeing is insecurity and fraud. And these are the two main points that people are uh, mostly concerned, but just leave other things to a side. Okay. But on the B BSA, or bilateral security agreement, oh, uh, the, the, the top... It's for letter, the oh. BSA. So we're coming now to the challenges ahead. Now, you, you go first. Now, we heard about the Taliban, we've heard about the uh, Pakistan, we're going to hear about the US. So on the challenges ahead, the international perspective, would you like to re-ask your question? Uh, I do have... You did. No, you didn't have, have a question. I do have questions. Can you re-ask your question? I, I'm sorry, we're moving on now. You'll have to ask. You'll have to be interested in the, in the question of the lady next to you. I'll, could you could you kindly ask your question? question? He thinks you're me. Okay. <laughs> it's not democracy in here. <laughs> okay. Would you just ask your question again for the yes. sake of everyone? Thank yes. you. Yes. Um, the notion of democracy and the results of the election 
be rendered meaningless um, if the new government, whoever is in charge, strikes a political settlement with the Taliban, because they may be given swathes of land to control and be in charge of, and I presume that many um, Taliban members will be given high positions in government. I think it, it depends on what they agree upon, uh, what sort of a peace, uh, a political settlement they come uh, with. Um, personally, I don't think uh, Taliban will agree to get uh, cabinet posts. Uh, Taliban think much higher, perhaps. Uh, if they agree to any uh, peace, I think they will just sit aside and uh, do a peace. I don't think Taliban are fighting for uh, cabinet posts. Uh, when I was in Kabul, I didn't notice much interest in terms of talking to the Taliban. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, I think that the, the three main candidates are, will be willing to open talks with the Taliban, but it is not an important issue at this very minute. They have not either promised to not to talk to the Taliban or to deliver uh, uh, a political settlement with them. So I don't think you, they, that uh, Afghans would feel betrayed. Is it, is, it uh, credible to, is it credible to stand without mentioning the Taliban, without mentioning the war? I it mean, is it, perfectly credible. I, I, the, the, the issue of the, of, the, of the need to reach a political settlement uh, is barely mentioned in, in the campaign. Do you, can we go back to our questioner? What do you think about what you're hearing? There's two more panellists to come, but what, you're sceptical, I think. Would you like to voice it a bit more? Um, I mean, I don't know when the a political deal will be agreed upon. I don't know whether it will be in the next four years. But if you're going to hold elections and then you're later down the line going to invite people who haven't stood for election into positions in government or give them large uh, parts of the land to control. It, uh, uh, it is speculation, but yeah. it, 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 might, it, it might come to fruition. But I'm saying if that were the case, wouldn't that render the results of the election meaningless? Well, I can give you a case study from recent Afghan history, which was in the early stages of the, of the bond process. They, uh, I was involved in providing some of the ad advice on the running of the Lloyd Jirga process, which is this first exercise when, uh, uh, when as part of the Bonn Agreement, uh, it had been decided that somehow or other, Afghans would choose their representatives, who would get together in Kabul, uh, and they would uh, give a mandate to the, uh, the transitional government. And, you know, we had, you know, there's a commission there of, of, of eminent Afghans, and they had people going all around the country electing representatives. And the commission was uh, were given strong advice, strong advice from the people, uh, from, you know, from Mr. Brahimi and uh, Karzai was beside him, that there are certain people that you have to get inside that lawyer Jirga tent, regardless of whether they get elected or not, because if you don't do that, there's no way this process is going to work and there will not be stability in Afghanistan. Now, some people were in favor, some people were against, but that's the way it was done, and that's the Afghanistan that everybody's living with at the moment. There were certain people that you had to have in the tent who had, a, uh, who had some kind of, they brought something to the process beyond the votes that they could deliver or their ability to get them, elect them uh, elected in certain, th uh, in certain constituencies. And I think a do similar you, do principle... Do you support that? It's, like, it's, like, it's not like vote rigging, it's democracy rigging. You shove them in afterwards, they uh, weren't well, voted for. Yeah, in England, we call it the House of Lords. No, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I think, this, uh, uh, I, I think that effort what meant bringing in gunmen, I mean, or rather the leaders of gunmen. Uh, they were, after all, the warlords who were unelected, who were brought in uh, because in the setup after Bonn, Unfortunately, both the U.S. and my successor at the U.N. Um, <laughs> decided that there was no, to forget about justice, to forget about ensuring that the government would have a monopoly on the means of violence, and therefore they accepted, uh, up, uh, arms open, the arrival of this group of warlords who have managed to sully the whole process. So, so our friend then. who asked this question, she's right. Don't, don't get voted on. Come in at the next stage with your Kalashnikov. <laughs> as I said, uh, uh, we're speculating now as to what kind of talks 
what kind of settlement, uh, whether there would be a referendum, we don't know, and it's too early. Uh, can I call you next? We're, we're yeah, not uh, sorry, we're not speculating. Can I just uh, talk for a minute before you ask the question regarding to atmosphere, when right. said, and regarding to the, uh, uh, my colleague uh, on the floor. I think the biggest mistake that was ever made, it was by Lakhdar Ibrahimi and Zalmay Khalilzad by bringing the most notorious warlords into the Luya Jirga and making them part of the Afghan government and Bush administration with coming with this ridiculous definition of good human rights abusers and bad human rights abusers. <laughs> and this is how it will be, unfortunately, as you said, like if there is any peace settlement, what we are scared and what we are fearing for, there will be another ridiculous definition of like-minded, uh, you know, Taliban okay. or like-minded warlords and ridiculous and uh, fundamentalist ones. Thank so, you. And I interrupted your question. The lady's point, I was just going to reinforce that it's not speculation in that there was a joint uh, Afghan National Army and Taliban patrol in Sangin at Christmas and they are being brought into the into the camp in large areas of, of Afghanistan and I, I don't so I don't think it's speculation I think she's absolutely right that that whoever comes into government will have to talk to them and they will will uh, will get a, a role Emma and Michael of course I mean um, in Afghanistan no war could be won I could guarantee that no one could win against the Taliban. They will be still there for, for, for centuries, I, I believe. So it has to come to an end uh, through dialogue or peaceful, uh, peaceful settlement. But how uh, and in what conditions? I think this is something that uh, we don't know. Um, going to the audience next. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, next week I'm going to work in Ukraine where I've previously seen the consequences of a Western approach of excessively legalistic and economic and not taking account of societies which are still semi-militarized and major mistakes. In the Afghan context, my question is this. As the military withdraw, as ISAF withdraws, is there a danger that the much needed and still desirable and appropriate Use the mic, Western, uh, sorry, Western assistance is going to be excessively humanitarian focused and not take sufficient account of some harsh realities of Afghanistan. I'm thinking particularly about the, the dominant role of men versus women and I can't help notice the audience we've got probably about half the audience is women, which is more than appropriate here. But Afghanistan, it may be too humanitarian and <laughs> developmental and, and not perhaps sufficiently reflecting some of the harsh realities that Michael Semple stressed. If, if I can just um, paraphrase you, you're talking about a sort of real politique that says deal with the Taliban. Uh, reluctantly. reluctantly. And, and our question at the back was saying, arguably don't deal with the Taliban. Do, you, do we feel this pressure for the next five years? Do we, or even, are we meant to be thinking of this for the next 20 years? Is this, uh, would you Amal answer this tension? Will we always be asking, why did we let these people in, these bunch of old women-hating nose slicers? I mean, is that what we're going to be asking for years to come? I, as I said earlier, uh, I don't think uh, one could beat Taliban by force. Um, but do you invite them in then? And you have to find a solution. Uh, what sort of a solution? How you could uh, make them lay their guns down? This is the main thing. And again, I would say that Taliban will, that will be the day of uh, um, committing suicide for the Taliban to, to join the government as a, um, a minister. I don't think they will join the uh, government uh, as uh, cabinet uh, members. Um, for them, either uh, running the whole country or sitting, uh, <coughs> feeling that, well, we, we have done our job and the uh, foreign so Do you agree off. with the gentleman here? Uh, re be realistic. Deal with them. Get them in. Yes, yeah, well, I mean, but, right. but you have to find uh, a, a proper way for it. No, of course you have to, to deal with them. I mean, I think we are all uh, agreed uh, in the West now that you need to talk to the Taliban and you need to structure uh, talks with them. Now, the question is, are they willing to talk at the moment seriously or not? My own belief is that they will try first uh, to, to carry out the military offensive, see how far they can go, 
And then probably, I would say, by the end of the summer of next year, they might decide that the time really has come to actually talk. Now, what would be the power sharing, or whatever you may call it, it's, a, it's another matter. I agree that it's unlikely to be ministries. It could well be influence in governorships. It could well be a demand for some kind of high ulema council which they might control. It's too, hard, it's too early to tell. But uh, I think, and I think Afghans do want uh, a, a settlement. They want peace with the Taliban. What they are not clear is what is the price they would be willing to pay to achieve it. I think the biggest dilemma for many Afghans are which Taliban do we talk about? Do we talk about the Hizb Islami? Do we talk about the Taliban of Mullah Omar's group? Do we talk about the Taliban of cross-border, like Baytullah Masood and other groups, who also have an interest inside Afghanistan and who also not only support the Afghan Taliban, but they also actively participating in many insurgency acts? So this is the biggest challenge for many Afghans when we speak about talking to the Taliban, which Taliban, and how. So, yeah, for this reason, I don't think that it will be really possible to come to any conclusion anytime soon because of the, you know, lots of complexity into the whole process and, of talks. And, and come to you, Michael, but the question was a moment ago, would it, does it debase the election that they're going to get some sort of power sharing regardless of the outcome? Does it debase the election? No, I don't want to answer this. You don't want to answer it? No, I don't want to answer why not? It's my choice. <laughs> Democracy. <laughs> the, the answer to that is no, it does not debase the election. And that is partly to do with the mandate that I believe that whoever wins this election will bring with them. And it is partly to do with the, uh, the constitution in Afghanistan and with the traditions of governance in Afghanistan. In terms of the mandate, although it's absolutely correct that dealing with the Taliban has, and has not been the top issue on the agenda, but it features there on the agenda, and certainly all candidates have chosen to raise this, and they have listened to what people are telling them, and I, be and I believe that whoever gets elected, mm. they will feel that they have a mandate to try and find some way of ending this war. You so, they, so, so cutting the deal will be consistent with the mandate. The Constitution is highly centralised, and a president and two vice presidents are being elected, and they essentially have the, the, have the authority <coughs> under the constitution to appoint everyone else in the structures of Afghanistan. The president of Afghanistan exercises considerable patronage power granted by the constitution, mm -hmm. which they can judiciously use to bind into the structure of government people who are far better on the inside than on the outside. How well they use that the will, do, will, will be the question and will be, the, will be what people like Huria rightly will be watching them like hawks to see is this deal good for Afghanistan or bad for Afghanistan. And to you with the scarf, pink scarf, you're on the next question. Thank you. I'm, I'm just really wondering whether the election is a veneer, the event is a veneer, because whoever takes over takes over a legacy that Mr Karzai has left of um, the most corrupt country in the world with political patronage, um, corruption that, that reaches into the upper echelons of the government, um, dealing out uh, favours for uh, political support. Um, and I wonder whether or not, um, no matter who, I mean, you know, Ashraf Ghani has written a book about this in which he identifies and defines what is a failed state, and he may as well be talking, and I think he is, about Afghanistan. And there's no money. Um, once, the, once the international funds have gone, okay. um, the, the, the international community has been talking about mining funds that have been taken over by... Uh, warlords and vested right. interests okay. who have also uh, co-opted the Taliban to protect them for, from, you know, I've what is it. essentially it's, rule of law. It's, a, it's another pessimist about the veneer of the election. Will, will this, will this put new president change much? Is it got the potential to change much, Francis? Well, I think it's going to be difficult. Uh, I, I mean, there is a structure now of corruption uh, and of uh, high-level corruption. And, and this is the way things have been going for the last 12 years. Right. So it's going to take time. Uh, I think one candidate may be more, uh, more assertive on this issue, but at the end of the day, they will have to settle down with some kind of, of, um, of 
um, understanding uh, with some of the corrupt uh, people in the... In Let me uh, change the subject myself uh, to the challenges ahead. The bilateral security agreement, uh, President Karzai has until August, I believe, to sign it himself, uh, but uh, has not. Am I correct about that? Uh, President Karzai isn't going to sign uh, the BSA. He's made it perfectly clear. He'll never sign uh, it. That he'll never sign it. The Americans uh, will wait out President Karzai, and the three uh, leading candidates will sign. <coughs> the only question mark would be uh, after, the, if and when they sign, what will, will President Karzai, carry, uh, ex-President Karzai, carry the flag against the U.S. at opposing as a nationalist, uh, as a, what the, he would call a surrender to the powers in the US. So let's talk about Karzai in a minute, but this BSA, do we know what's in it? Is it already written? Is it just going to be given to the new president? Here you are, love, will you sign that? I mean, it, what's going to happen? Is it, who wrote it, Haria? What does it say? Uh, we don't know who wrote it, but we have it on the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with website, and it was approved by uh, Louis Jirga in Afghanistan that happened last year. And uh, more shockingly, I want to say that when I was in Afghanistan and I was talking to the people, uh, I have met many of people who have lost their family members in the U.S. with their aerial bombardments or nitrates were brought by Karzai to the Luya Jirga that happened last year to decide on a BSA. And, but then when I asked them what have happened, why you would have approved a BC when you lost your family members in that. They said, well, even we were not uh, agree with the whole content, but the majority of the people were agreed, so this is why. I think many candidates in Afghanistan, they promised to the people that they will sign the BC, and this is uh, like, at least Dr. Abdullah said he would do it in the first week of his office in Afghanistan. By the way, out of those uh, three candidates, uh, only Abdullah was not involved in it. Uh, um, Zalmay Rasul, as a foreign minister, was involved with the whole process, and also uh, Ashraf Ghani was uh, the person who, at the last minute, he, he finalized the whole uh, draft. So for, for those of us, again, wanting a briefing, the BSA with the USA, if I may put it that way, uh, <laughs> will be signed. Yes. Right, let's move on to President Karzai. Is he going to move into a porter cabin next to the, de next to the presidential palace? Uh, I believe that you were telling me that he was going to do that. Yeah. Would you tell us what's going to happen to him, Imal? Oh, well, recently he said that uh, the government of Afghanistan promised him, or rather they're building a, a house uh, uh, within the presidential palace somewhere for him, so he will be staying there. Um, personally, um, I, I believe uh, Karzai will have some sort of... Uh, he will be an influential uh, character. Uh, but it, again, it depends who is winning the election. Uh, if Dr. Abdullah wins the election, I'm pretty sure that he will be consulting him time to time on some issues, but he will not be welcome as much as he might want to, uh, because I want to. Uh, if uh, Zalma Rasul wins, I, I believe he will have uh, his bedroom next to his uh, office. But uh, if um, uh, Ashraf Ghani wins, probably they'll be a bit uh, uh, friendlier than uh, Dr. Abdullah, but uh, still a bit uh, away from the main uh, politics. And what status will he have, Francis? Will he still be pulling important strings? Well, I think uh, that the choice of, uh, of a palace uh, ne next to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to the presidential palace speaks for itself. Uh, although I have to say that Ashraf Ghani told me that he fully understood the reason for the president, to, the, the current president, to have a palace next to the presidential palace for security reasons. He also said he would give uh, President Karzai, he would consult him, he might even appoint him as the head of a council, of an advisory council. Nonetheless, uh, I, I don't see, I don't think President Karzai wants to be, to become purely a Baba Imilat as uh, former King Zayu Shah became. I think he would expect to do more, but uh, a would lot he be of ambassador the, to the UN. Uh, I think that he would prefer to be in Afghanistan, and this is one of the of the key issues. Uh, does uh, no president, no former president or head of state of Afghanistan have remained in Afghanistan? Are they dead or alive? No, Burhanuddin um, and Mujaddi were there. Mujaddidi was only for a few... Three yeah, months, yes, three but uh, Rabani was for uh, long. Ra yeah, but Rabani did not give power, uh, did not... Uh, there was no election 
to remove uh, Rabani. That's I mean, he, he handed the power to President Karadai. Yes, all right. So the final minutes of on the challenges ahead, um, Michael and, and, uh, uh, and Hori haven't spoken on this yet, but let's come to people who haven't spoken in the audience on the challenges ahead. I think you have, haven't you? Well, no. no, you haven't, sorry. <laughs> well, now's your chance. Isn't having uh, the, the palace right next to the presidential palace starting on the wrong foot? And what do the people think of that? Do we know? seeing as it's happening for the first time. All right. Yeah, I think uh, when that uh, a kind of offer was made by President Karzai himself, and he was offering himself to have a palace within the palace, it created a lot of <laughs> speculations among many Afghans. And what they were calling him as another Vladimir Putin, who want to still keep an eye on the whole Afghan politics, and he's paving way for the next presidential elections. And his favorite candidate, as uh, it was uh, disputed by uh, Pasalai, but he is Zalmay Rasul, what many Afghans are believing. And he is unlimitedly giving and offering the government resources to, to do his campaign in all over the country. So this is what many Afghans are seeing, that maybe in, after four years, it will be the same scenario as it happened in Russia with removing Zalmay and Karzai coming back. So. I, I think the honest position amongst us would be that we don't know. I think that we would be uh, wise to remember you know, Enoch Powell and the, uh, all political careers end in failure. Uh, and that's possible in Afghanistan as well. That they, uh, um, uh, it, uh, I think that the, the, idea that the idea that Afghanistan matches the situation in Russia and Putin, um, I think it's fantasy, whoever, whoever explores that fantasy. Afghanistan is different. Um, from Russia, the political relations are different. I think that um, uh, I think that uh, President Karzai will feel, or and then ex-President Karzai will feel deeply frustrated um, that he's no longer the centre of attention, uh, and that other people are actually making the decisions, and that they're doing their, they're they're humouring him and they're using him as a symbol of continuity. And I think the interesting question is, what happens when he gets frustrated by that? Uh, we know twelve years ago Karzai was the Washington's chosen one. He was put in that place as the president of Afghanistan, and there was no, nobody who said no. And we know the legacy he's leaving is poverty, corruption, insecurity. Please, uh, which one of the candidates do you think is capable enough to bring this country into you know, what is you know, supposed to be, what Karzai was supposed to do when he was chosen? Horia? Yeah, I think it's so difficult to say because it is not only about what Karzai have left, it's also to look at the devastation that Afghanistan have been facing in the past three and a half can decades. I, can I paraphrase that? Is there a window of opportunity? Millions of Afghans vote, a candidate is chosen, there's some optimism. Is there a, is there a period of time when one of the candidates can move the country forward? Is, is that possible to answer the gentleman? I, the answer is yes, but it will be really, really slow. And it also depends who will be elected. To you with the microphone. Um, yeah, I'm an optimist for the future. I think two reasons. One is that uh, Afghans see themselves as Afghan first and then whatever their tribe is second. So there's a sense of national unity. The other thing is the economy, the legal economy, which no one has spoken about. Um, I think there's... There are, there's an optimistic future for the economy developing. Uh, now, the panel were already optimistic uh, about aspects of this. I don't think they're going to disagree with you. Uh, does anyone have a, dis a point that's against that? Because we're coming to a close um, to you. And then I'll ask panel for your closing remarks. I can try and make a tenuous link to that last comment, but I'm not sure it would be logical. Um, I think my question was actually a little bit more about um, even if there is the sec a second round and if it does manage to happen on the 28th of May, um, realistically, will there be a functioning cabinet by Christmas? And what does that mean for governing, you know, a pretty difficult country and the economic future that the gentleman before me mentioned as well? Because I really do think the next six to eight months are going to be quite challenging and just simply getting a cabinet in place is going to be tough. Uh, I don't think the cabinet is an issue. Probably they already know who are uh, um, their ministers. Uh, within a week, they could introduce it to the parliament. But whether parliament will approve all those candidates, that might take some time. But I don't think 
um, these candidates uh, don't know who are their uh, cabinet members. Okay, so can I ask you for some closing comments, uh, going in reverse order? Horia, would you like to begin? Uh, what was the most important thing said this evening, and what was not said this evening? Well, I think uh, the most important things was that we are all optimistic about the future of Afghanistan, and we are all optimistic that the not in the audience, elections, but you, you, you. yeah, the elections may happen. I think what haven't been said much is that uh, you know how the international community is going to support Afghanistan beyond 2014 once the international troops are not present in Afghanistan. Because many of international aid is militarized and it's linked to the military presence of international troops in the country. Francis? Well, I think the, I think the BSA is essential because only with the BSA will it, be, will it will continued financial assistance to the Afghan government continue, uh, uh, overseas uh, fin uh, financial assistance. I am not so optimistic about the economy. I, I'm not sure whether you, this, the speaker mentioned the legal economy or the illegal economy. Legal, he said. I, uh, legal. Because the illegal economy, I think, uh, has a fairly good future. Uh, as for the legal uh, economy, uh, quite honestly, it, it all depends. The departure of so many foreign troops will make a difference. The fact that many people will lose uh, employment or will find their employment uh, deeply downgraded. So all I would say is, I think Afghanistan will survive. Uh, I think uh, Afghanistan will pull through. But I do think that we have a couple of years uh, ahead of us, which are going to be difficult, and which, with the help of people who love Afghanistan and who have invested so much in Afghanistan, they will be able to overcome uh, the, uh, the, the difficulty they'll have. I'm hopeful and I think that uh, um, uh, we cannot get uh, even uh, lower to the to the state that we are right now uh, in Afghanistan in a way. Uh, I, I, I believe um, uh, Afghans will manage it and uh, I don't agree, or rather, I, I hurt when I hear a lot that uh, um, everyone blame Afghans for the for the uh, for the um, uh, corruption and also for all no. sorts of things. I think it's not only Afghans; uh, the foreigners also played a big, big role right. in that. Um, but I believe uh, within the next five years, we will have a different Afghanistan and very much a positively different Afghanistan. What was good about the discussion here was that we had, I think, informed optimism combining the you know, audience and panel, which is different from the fairy tale optimism that we've heard from various official parties over the years. So, I mean, you know, I think people who were talking optimistically were also listing out the challenges. And so that's, that's all that's good. In terms of what we didn't, what we didn't, we didn't talk about was we probably we didn't spend much time on Pakistan, and I didn't you know, go, into, go into that question there. There are equally difficult decisions to be made by people in Pakistan, and that will impact on, the, on what happens in both of the countries. Uh, and you know, does the military move away from the, the stuff that they've been doing over the past few years? Does the civilian government actually you know, get a chance to do what it says it wants to do in terms of building this cooperative relationship with Afghanistan? That will help determine the outcomes in both countries. And although at the moment the US is inclined to sign, sign the BSA with whoever moves into the, uh, to the presidential palace and is inclined to maintain a sort of residual relationship with Afghanistan to see the thing through, if something were to happen to change that, if a messy election and, you know, and things not going quite so well were to, you know, were to actually persuade the, uh, you know, persuade Congress to say, just cut it all off. Persuade, uh, persuade President Obama to say, look, this is just too much for me. That would immediately destabilize Afghanistan because without this substantial continuing subsidy to the Afghan security forces, it's difficult to maintain the cohesiveness of the Afghan state. Thank you. So, I mean, I've learned that there are three main candidates. Uh, the first round will be disputed. There will be fraud and rigging. <laughs> Uh, there will be negotiations. Negotiation. There will be negotiations to bring in the Taliban in some way or other. Uh, but this is all good. This is all yes. good. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, dispute resolution. But, but
but there is going to be the same level as insecurity. Things can't get any worse. And it reminds me of another meeting I went to when someone passed on a Jewish uh, phrase. I don't know if this is true to our Jewish friends in the audience. Where there is death, there is hope. So, uh, you have to be a little bit more humble than this. I mean, seriously, seriously that's, not, that's not actually a summary of, that, of this discussion. No, but seriously. bear with me, I haven't okay, done okay, good, 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 good. But on the other side, we heard, we heard of people who have lived, worked, been born in the country telling us of the reasons why this is a moment. And they're celebrating already outside, <laughs> uh, here on the Edgware Road. Uh, no, why this is a moment that will change the country. And to you in the audience for your fabulous questions. And to Horia Masadik, Michael Semple, Emile Parsley and uh, Francis Vendrelas, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.